Um, my name is Chris Walsh, and it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Matt State, while he's uh, setting up his computer. And we're really thrilled that we're able to uh, get Matt to uh, join us and uh, give us a lecture. Um, so Matt received his uh, undergraduate and his medical degrees at uh, Stanford University. And then he did a residency in psychiatry and a fellowship in child psychiatry at UCLA at their Neuropsychiatric Institute, and then went to Yale, where he earned a PhD in genetics. Uh, and he joined the faculty at Yale and rose through the ranks there um, in, uh, and was the Donald Cohen Professor of Child Psychiatry uh, and uh, Genetics. And in 2013, he moved to the University of California, San Francisco to become the Chair of Psychiatry uh, and also the uh, Oberndorf Family Distinguished Professor as well as the Directory of the Langley Porter Psychiatric Institute. Um, and uh, so Matt has been interested in uh, the causes of many child psychiatric uh, conditions, uh, notably Tourette syndrome and especially autism spectrum disorders, uh, as he'll tell you about uh, today. Uh, his work has been cited um, twice, actually, by Science Magazine uh, and others as uh, top 10 scientific breakthroughs of the year. And Matt has really been a leader of a large uh, consortium uh, funded by the Simons Foundation, uh, the Simon Simplex Collection, and the Simon Simplex Genetics Initiative, uh, where he's worked with investigators from all over the country um, and uh, to advance our understanding of the causes of autism spectrum disorders, as he'll be telling you about today. And I think what's really remarkable about Matt is not only his intellectual brilliance and leadership, uh, but also his ability to, to get people to work together who don't uh, always necessarily work together easily. Uh, and he's just a very, very generous person and a very warm heart. Uh, and so he's not only, uh, as I say, an intellectual leader, but also a real social leader. Uh, and uh, so we're delighted to have him here. He's been, not surprisingly, awarded uh, many ways for the work he's done. Uh, just to mention a couple of them, um, he recently received the Ruane Prize uh, for Research in Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, uh, and just this past weekend, uh, he was inducted into the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies. Uh, so once again, thank you very much, Matt, for joining us, and we're really looking forward to your lecture. Chris, thank you. Um, I have to say that was really one of the loveliest introductions I've ever had. People normally list you know, your publications and, and run through your CV, but I don't know that anyone has ever. Um, it said that I was a warm uh, and generous person uh, in an introduction before. And I'm really proud of that. Uh, um, thanks. So I, I am going to talk to you today about, um, about the genetics of autism spectrum disorders. And there are going to be three major points to the talk. Um, the first is to try to convince you that we are, in fact, in the midst of uh, an incredibly exciting revolution um, in gene discovery and autism. Um, we'll see how I do on that one. The second um, is, uh, is just to talk a little bit about why that's important, because I, I, I'm not sure that it's immediately obvious uh, from the standpoint of people are suffering or working in the clinic how the discovery of individual genes are going to lead to, um, to uh, advances in, in therapeutics. And then the third point I'm going to make is that um, uh, we're presented with some challenges as a consequence of what we found now with gene discovery. So it's been very exciting. In some ways, it's been daunting. Um, but I'm going to end the talk by trying to give you a sense about a number of, I think, very exciting paths forward uh, to move now from gene discovery um, uh, to uh, an actionable understanding of the pathophysiology of autism. Um, so I'm going to start in this audience. I, I'm not going to spend any time on, on the diagnosis. Um, but, but I do uh, um, want to start uh, by harking back to the checkered um, past in psychiatry in which the pathophysiological mechanism uh, that was most often cited in the 50s and 60s was uh, 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 um, refrigerator mothers. The coldness um, of mothers was, uh, was um, suggested to be the cause. And in fact, um, it is a checkered past, and, and we can think that that's really remote. But in fact, in the literature, in psychiatric literature, through the early 90s, there are still articles about the psychogenic causes of autism. And um, recently was at a talk where someone was telling uh, a story about about their personal experience with a severely affected brother with autism um, uh, in the 60s, where uh, the recommendation to the family was to remove the child uh, from the family in order to uh, release them, to take them out of the context of the psychologically damaging interaction with the cold mother uh, in order to have the um, uh, person get better. Of course, uh, that person uh, did not get better. Um, but um, I, I'm going to come back to this point. But, um, but 
what I want to say is that at the same time, so through the um, 70s, 80s, and 90s, it was clear that um, while there were these uh, psychoanalytic theories of autism, that there was also strong evidence uh, from um, a variety of uh, experiments in nature, predominantly twins and twin studies suggesting that genes play a major role. And still today, uh, we know that uh, you know, there are multiple studies of, uh, of heritability and autism, and they all show that genes play a major role. Um, and what I'm going to argue is that um, it doesn't really matter whether, sort of exactly how much of a role they play. They play a large role, um, and as a consequence, as I, I will try to make the case, that being able to focus on that piece of risk, while there may be other, there clearly are other types of risks, that that um, can be important for a variety of reasons. So one is that in terms of thinking about somatic or pharmacological or other um, uh, um, interventions, um, that it's really been a lack of understanding at the molecular, cellular, and circuit level in autism that has been a major hindrance to think about how we can really move forward. And we think about the history of contemporary medicine, right? In psychiatry, we haven't, for any psychiatric um, uh, disorder, had a new medication, truly new m mechanism of action in 40 years. Think about contemporary medicine if that was the case in cancer, if, if, if the, our latest treatments were 40 years old, in hypertension, in autoimmune disease. So. Um, the, the fact is, is that in all of those areas, an understanding of basic pathophysiological mechanisms, again, at the cellular, molecular, in the brain, at circuit level, is, is important. Um, and again, I'm going to make the argument that gene discovery is one important way to get traction on this, and why I think all you need to know is that genes play a substantial role um, uh, in order to drive, in, in order to motivate uh, gene discovery. So some people think that this, you know, is, is a fool's errand. We're looking for a variation in the genetic code. There are three billion bases in the human genome, and we're looking not for a gene that's present in a kid with autism and not present in a child without autism but a variation maybe in just a single letter out of those three billion bases, and that seems like a tough problem. But in fact, one of the reasons that gene discovery, I think, is so promising is that it's the easiest part of the problem. Because when you look at the number of cells in the human central nervous system, there are 100 billion neurons, there are 100 trillion synapses, and then when you begin to think about the complexity of human development and of environmental factors that may influence that development, really, gene discovery is a reductionist approach. It's a way of trying to get a handle on, you know, the, the spool and grabbing a thread and then pulling on it. So I'm going to tell you about how progress has gone in, in, in trying to do that. The first thing that I will say is that there's been tremendous progress across all of uh, contemporary medicine in looking for uh, the genetics of complex disease, but the story of autism is somewhat different. So in, in many, many disorders, the story has been that in order to understand the genetics of complex disease, what we found um, is that, um, uh, that uh, the genetics are uh, generally variations um, that are common in the population, so that many people carry them and have very small effect sizes. And, and a method to identify these common variants of small effect are called genome-wide association studies, and there's just been an explosion across inflammatory disease, um, uh, um, uh, hypertension, a uh, variety of other things, macular degeneration, um, and in some areas of psychiatry, particularly recently in schizophrenia. That has not been the story in autism. So far, genome-wide association studies have not identified a single common variation of small effect that's reliably contributing to autism. So I'm going to explain I th why we think that that's the case, but I think w a clear sort of hint has been around for 40 years, because what we've known is that, in fact, rare mutations of large effect, um, mutations that are rare in the population, not common in the population, have large effects, not small effects, play a role in autism. And, and in a way, it's taken us a while to appreciate what's been sitting right in front of us. For 40 years, we've known the locus for fragile X metal retardation protein, and in fact, it's absolutely clear that they're elevated rates of autism spectrum disorder in that and other monogenic syndromes, some of which you just heard about from Dr. Yanish. Um, now, I, I want to move you forward to sort of around 2003, 2004, where so the first successes in identifying genes in autism that were not clearly part of that kind of monogenic syndrome that had sort of a, a variety of uh, pathognomonic features that could be identified, and then a single Mendelian gene was identified. And in this case, there were a number of successes, um, uh, some, the initial ones from Thomas Bergeron's lab in Paris for a gene called Neuroligin 4X and Shank 3, um, and, uh, and 
and then there were some successes uh, in, um, uh, across the country with a gene called contactin associated protein 2, and right here in Boston, in Chris's lab with a gene called NAG9. And, and, and what these were were really a harbinger of where the field was going. So they were a harbinger because they were pointing to um, rare mutations to recessive forms of autism and to new mutations in the genome playing a role. And in fact, um, that turns out to be the story in the last couple of years in, in driving this revolution in gene discovery. Um, now, what I would say is that these were tremendously important in giving us those clues, but they were very hard-won successes. So on the one hand, the de novo and rare mutations, really it was a matter of sitting in the lab and waiting for a rare child or rare family to walk in the door. With the recessive mutations, it was going to the Middle East or going to the Amish and finding within inbred families an unusual family that had a recessive form of autism. So there really, at this point, was not a systematic way to identify genes contributing to autism in typical um, uh, uh, autism, the autism that we would see coming into clinic uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. That shifted in about 2007 um, with the identification, um, really it was a convergence of this understanding that rare mutations and de novo mutations might be important, and um, the availability um, of uh, patient samples to, to study, um, and that combined with new technology. And the new technology was just a higher resolution way of looking at the genome. Um, so in about 2007, there was a, that we had the capacity to look at the genome at greater resolution than ever before. Still, we could only look at tens of thousands of bases of DNA, of the three billion bases at a time, so we weren't to single base resolution. But in doing that, what we were able to find, actually what Jonathan Sabot and Michael Wigler were able to find, we were not able to find it in 2007 was that um, there was an increased rate of new losses and gains in chromosomal material in children with autism, particularly from families in which there was only a single affected individual versus families um, who did not have autism. So these are called de novo copy number variations because they refer to variations in the number of copies of chromosome, of a segment of a chromosome that a family has. And these are small. They're submicroscopic. We couldn't see them before two, about 2005. We didn't have the technology. Um, and then Mike Wigler, who actually figured out way to see them, then applied that to autism and found that there was this over-representation. That was followed very quickly by some very important observations. So what Mike Wigler and Jonathan Sabat saw was that there was a dramatic increase, a tenfold increase in these um, uh, losses and gains new, meaning they were only present in children. They were not being transmitted um, from uh, the, um, uh, the, the parents except through a spontaneous mutation in the germline of either the mother or the father. Um, but that was for a group of mutations. And then what these next papers showed was that these were not random events. This was not chromosomal breakage syndrome. There were individual reasons of the genome in which these mutations were lining up. And by lining up, that we could create a statistical framework that allowed us to interpret how many of them were lining up in unrelated individuals in order to get a strong sense that they were contributing to the disorder. Now, um, I'm going to spend uh, the middle part of the talk focusing on a series of experiments that were done uh, in my lab and, and in several others, but focusing really on, on what Chris mentioned, the Simon Simplex collection. Because out of that discovery from Mike Wigler's lab came a concerted effort, a partnership between scientists and philanthropy in order to create um, a patient cohort that would be particularly uh, amenable to looking for de novo mutation. So de novo mutation, again, is new mutation. It's happening spontaneously either in sperm or egg right before conception. That leads to every cell in the child having that mutation and none of the remaining cells in the parents having the mutation, like a lightning strike, a genetic lightning strike in the child. Um, and, and so one way to begin to think about how you might enrich a population for that kind of finding would be to get a group of families in which the parents were clearly unaffected, which there was only a single affected child in the family, um, and in which there were unaffected siblings. And, and, and this this is what Jim Simons, along with Mike Wiggler, and then the Simons Foundation set out to do, and eventually built a, a cohort of 3,000 families that contributes to the research that I'm going to show you. It allows us to do two things. One is when you're looking for a new mutation, it is a beautifully simple experiment. You can look at the DNA of the parents, you look at the DNA of the children, anything that's new in the children that isn't present in the parents is either a mistake or a de novo mutation. So um, it's, a, it's a very simple experiment, but it also 
allows us to do another really important thing, which is then to compare the rate of new genetic events in the kids who are affected versus the kids in the same family who are unaffected, which really from a geneticist standpoint is sort of the perfectly matched comparison. The first thing that we did was at about 2011 was to go back and see whether or not we could replicate what Mike Wiggler and Jonathan Sabat have found with regard to these submicroscopic copy number variations. This is Stefan Sanders in the lab who led one of two groups doing this with the Simon Simplex collection. Um, and this is just showing that the total rate of de novo copy number variations in probands versus siblings, and this is updated now. We initially published this in 2011, but this is sort of the complete set of probands and siblings now from the Simon Simplex collection, showing a dramatic overrepresentation. And there are three versions of this, and they're all showing it doesn't really matter how you count. You can count the number of CNVs, you can count the people that have at least one copy number, de novo copy number variation, or you can count the number of genes that are hit by de novo copy number variation, and you see a dramatic excess. So this was uh, an absolute replication, kind of a spot-on replication of the prior work. And as I said, uh, we already had a sense that these were not randomly distributed through the genome, so we looked to see where they lined up in the genome in order to get a sense about specific spots that were related. We found two in the paper in 2011. There are at least a dozen now that are well-validated in the literature. I'm just going to focus on one. This is one that we found on chromosome 7. Um, and for those of you who um, are not in the clinic ever, this is just a brief video of a child with classic autism, and there's no sound here. All, all I want you to do is to sort of pay attention, get, get a visceral sense of the social relatedness of this child to the, to the rest of the people in the room. That's his father on the right. Uh, that's an examiner on the left. And this is classic autism. This is, in fact, a child who doesn't have useful language, did not develop uh, useful language. Um, he uses a picture board to communicate. But I think the, the kind of defining feature of autism is a fundamental impairment in reciprocal social social communication. And I think even without sound, you, you, anyone can see who's seen, knows what a normal 13-year-old boy looks like, has a sense that this is not typical social relatedness. Now, what we found was that there was a region of the genome on chromosome 7 with 25 genes that reliably, if you had too many copies of those genes, so you had one extra copy of that small segment of the chromosome, it would lead reliably to this phenotype. We looked very carefully to see whether there was anything special about it. It looks just like idiopathic classic autism. This is what happens when you lose that exact same portion of the genome. Oh, if we had sound, it would be better, because here we need sound. In the back, do we have sound? Oh, this is such a good video. <laughs> it really is. And, and 2020 is such a good scientific source. It's okay, actually. If he gets down here, he's just giving the prelude. And what he's saying is, can you be f born too friendly? And, and he's going to now try to answer the question about whether or not you can be born too friendly. I'm going to turn that off so we don't blast the audience. Nestled in the woods, where music okay. fills the air, where you can dance to the beat of your own drum. Exactly same region of DNA, same 25 genes lost now instead of gained. And now, again, what I want you to just get a visceral sense of the social connectedness of the kids in this room with the person that they just met, not their father, not an examiner. Kids love to ask questions, but not as much as these kids. My favorite color is blue. I have met Barney the dinosaur. Yay! I live in New York City. Do you have any sons or daughters? I do. Wow. I have two daughters and a son. Wow. And kids love to make friends, but not like these kids. What nationality are you? I'm Italian. How oh. are you, buddy? Okay, so um, now I'm back at Harvard Medical School, but perfect timing. Please, come on. This just makes it more fun. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, uh, th obviously there's a reason I wanted to show you that. One, it's, it's extraordinary. So what you were looking at is kids with Williams syndrome, and, um, and I think, if, again, if any of you are in the clinic and see children with Williams syndrome, you won't be surprised that that's a highly reliable behavioral phenotype. Intense interest in social affiliation actually sometimes pathological interest in social affiliation, high rates of anxiety, never social anxiety, intellectual disability in a way that, um, uh, that 
um, uh, mild to moderate typically um, just as, as we see um, with regard to the duplications in chromosome 7. So um, the reason that I pointed this out is I think um, the, the hypothesis that I'm getting at is that we can do gene discovery, that we can look at variations in the genome and we can transverse this enormous space from genes to cells to brain to environment to social context and that that's still going to be relevant, that the genes are going to have sufficient impact on social functioning that understanding what they're doing is a, is, a, is, a, is a relevant observation for us and something that might be a tractable point of intervention. And I think that at least, you know, um, in, with a, um, uh, certainly we came into it with a, a, with a particular perspective, but I think that this example shows you've got only 25 out of 21,000 genes. And, and, and you have just a shift in the representation, probably in the expression, overexpression versus underexpression of these genes, right? And what you see is this profound difference in interest in social communication. I think it does suggest, um, you know, a kind of, again, a, 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 an inferential experiment that looking for variations in the genome uh, can give us insights, profound insights into the regulation, development and regulations of complex social functioning uh, in, in the developed organism. All right, so um, we thought that that was a great experiment. We were very happy with being able to identify regions of the genome that reliably increase risk for autism, but it wasn't really the experiment that we wanted to do because we wanted to use genes as an entree into neurobiology, and the best way to do that is to have a single gene with a single letter mutation in that gene because it is the most tractable thing that neuro our neurobiologist colleagues can work with. And fortunately, um, we were at the right place at the right time because um, there was a dramatic and has been over the course of this is really almost the spread of my lab starting in 1997 and now to 2014. And this is the cost of sequencing the letter code of DNA, right? It's fall, that's Moore's law, which everyone touts as this remarkable thing in computer science. The green line is human sequencing. There are very few things in science or any place else that have fallen at the rate of the cost of sequencing. And what it allowed us to do was to sequence every letter of every gene in the genome in the Simon Simplex collection. The same collection where initially we were only able to look at sections that were, you know, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of DNA bases, uh, and now we could look at, the, at, at each letter of each gene. This is what we found. So it, a bunch of people were racing forward at the same time, used the same technology. Many were using different parts of the Simon Simplex collection. And what we found was that this almost exactly recapitulated what we saw with copy number variation. That, that de novo new point mutations, and particularly ones that damage proteins, were dramatically overrepresented in kids with autism versus without. These are all of the papers now that have shown that. Everyone has gotten the, uh, almost the identical answer in terms of how much of an effect as a group these de novo, what we call either loss of function or likely gene disrupting mutations carry. And, and again, an important observation here was that not only do they as a class carry risk, but, but it was sort of the perfect accident. So the base rate of these in the typical population is extremely low. You will see a single loss of function mutation in about one of every 20 to 50 um, uh, typically developing children. And what that means, the base rate is so low that if we see them and we see them adding up in the same gene in kids with autism, um, in unrelated kids with autism, that provides tremendous statistical power because it's essentially it's calculating how likely is a lightning strike to hit the same spot in the genome twice. So we can leverage that for a really strong statistical argument. And all of these papers, this is from Boston here, Mark Daly's lab at, um, at uh, the Broad, uh, Evan Eichler's lab in Washington, my lab at Yale, and now at UCSF um, and, uh, and Mike Wiggler's lab at Cold Spring Harbor spread out across the country all with the same answer, landing on this set of genes that had strong statistical evidence, less than a 5% chance that we were wrong, um, corrected for all of the comparisons that we're looking at. And, and that was the list as of 2012 or 13. We've now been able to repeat the experiment as a collaboration. Again, this is a Simon Simplex collaboration with Evan Eichler's lab, Mike Wiggler's lab. And we've repeated it again, and we've gotten the same answer now in 2,500 Simon's families, where we were able to collect 2,500 probands and, and about 1,800 siblings. Again, dramatic overrepresentation of loss of function mutations of every flavor. And in fact, we see some signal in missense mutations, which isn't terribly surprising, because some fraction of those are also going to have a significant impact on gene function. 
What this has led to is exactly the same thing we've done first with CNVs, then in the early stage of exome, but we look to see where these lightning strikes are accumulating, and we can now start to create a list. Really, this is for someone who's been in this for 20 years and spent the first 18 or so completely wandering in the dark, to, just to be able to slow, show this slide is enormously exciting. Um, so what you're looking at on the left all the way is with a false discovery rate of less than 1%, all of these, uh, this list has a false discovery rate of less than 10%. And I want to bring your attention to two characteristics of this. So I'm just going to take you through the, 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 the strongest genes. These are genes where I think everyone would agree. It's about as close to definitive from a statistical standpoint, and now since they're being found across different laboratories in different places. You know, we're moving from calling them candidate genes to just calling them autism genes. But so when you think about, do they give you an immediate clue about what's going on? In that list, we have um, uh, Ankerin 2 is a, is a gene that's involved in, um, uh, in binding to the actin site of skeleton and neurons. CHD2 is a chromatin modifier that not unlike MECP2 is involved in global regulation of gene expression. CHD8 does a similar thing. Descam is a cell adhesion molecule. Um, the next gene is in the Down syndrome region is a tyrosine kinase involved in um, uh, um, uh, phosphorylation of other proteins. GRIN2B is part of a, um, a glutamate receptor. It's a subunit. Um, KDM5B is another gene that's involved in histone modification and overall gene regulation. Um, SCN2A is a sodium channel. So one gestalt from this is that, there, that um, it's not a simple answer. So initially there was a hypothesis that autism was a disease of synaptic proteins, and these are proteins that are throughout the cell in every cellular compartment. So on, on, that's an interesting observation. But I also think that there's actually, when you take a look at it, if you don't do any statistical analysis, but you just ask how many genes in this list are involved in the, in the coordinated regulation of gene expression, like MECP2, the beautiful lecture that you just heard, all of these genes are chromatin modifiers or histone modifiers. So it suggests two things. One is that this is a heterogeneous disorder. There are many paths to Rome. On the other hand, it suggests it's not completely random and that our hope, in fact, that this will converge on a number of pathways and biological mechanisms. Not a single one, but a small enough number so that 400 or 1,000 mutations doesn't mean 400 and a, or 1,000 different um, treatment approaches. Um, just to give you an overall sense um, of uh, some other kind of 30,000-foot uh, findings from this study, which actually is unpublished. I don't know why it's not showing up here, but will be out this month, we think in two or three weeks, um, in, in Nature. Um, and uh, this is um, one of the things that you can see I just showed you is there's an enrichment in chromatin modifiers. In those genes, there's also enrichment in targets of fragile X mental retardation protein. So the first clue that we had 40 years ago may be one of the best clues to the underlying biology of typical autism autism, even though it was identified as part of a Mendelian syndrome. And then we see embryonically expressed genes and synaptic proteins coming out. Um, this, I love it because it's one of the reasons I mentioned in the first slide, the refrigerator mother, we have driven a spike through the heart of the refrigerator mother theory. Most of these de novo point mutations are coming from fathers, 80, 75 to 80 percent, um, and, and they increase with paternal age. I haven't been able to cover it and there wasn't time, but like um, copy number variation, what we find is that while these carry very large risks, we're talking 20-fold increases in risks for the group of genes where I went down the list at an FDR of less than 0.1. So 20-fold as compared to you know, a 5 to 10% increase for common variation and other disorders. Um, but while we see that very strong effect, when people are doing similar studies in samples of patients with schizophrenia without autism, intellectual disability without autism, epilepsy without autism, congenital heart disease without autism, they're finding not only some of the same mechanisms, but some of the very same genes. Um, overall, um, I'm, I'm running a little short on time, so I'm not going to talk about IQ in general, but I'm happy to for those who have an interest. It's sort of a hot area right now in thinking about the relationship between social and overall cognitive functioning. But I do want to say that what we're now able to estimate is that from the Simon Simplex collection, we have a really good handle on the fact that these, these de novo copy number and point mutations are responsible conservatively for 20 percent of what you will see in clinic walking in the door. So if we complete the experiment and find all of the genes, we will have a genetic diagnosis in about 20%. It will be higher in girls, um, uh, maybe as high as 35% in girls with idiopathic autism. Now, I, I do want to make a point that while this was an important and systematic approach, 
it's finding a particular set of genes. It's finding genes that are vulnerable to the loss of a single copy. And in fact, um, uh, there has been an entire other line of work actually pioneered by, um, uh, by Dr. Walsh and his protégés, uh, Dr. Gleason, Dr. Morrow, um, uh, which has, um, it's so welcoming. Um, <laughs> which has found that there are also rare mutations that involve the loss of two copies and are rare recessive forms of autism. And in this case, when you look at the list of genes, there's not a strong overlap between this list of genes and the ones that we're finding. And I think that there are two plausible explanations for that. One is that we can estimate from our studies that there are gonna be between 400 to 1,000 genes that will be vulnerable to a single copy loss. And, and, um, and so, and we've only found about 40 of them, so there are lots more. There may, in fact, be overlap here. But the other thing is, is that it matters how you look for things. If you look for things that are vulnerable to loss of a single copy, you might not find things that are, lo that are vulnerable to a complete loss of function, a complete knockout. And conversely, the other way around, if you're looking for things where the human organism can tolerate the loss of both copies, you may not find something um, uh, with, with just a single copy. But it's, it's a story that still remains to be written. All right, so the end of the talk now is going to just give you a 30,000 foot view of um, what at least how we're thinking about the view from here. So tremendous opportunity, again, for someone. I realize that, you know, I'm also a clinician and you go into clinic and you feel like we're moving at a snail's pace. But when I put on my science hat and I walk into the lab, we're moving at light speed compared to how we were for the last decade. And, and, and the science side of me says that that's, that that's a valuable thing. Um, and what we found are we have mutations encoding, whether they're loss of function homozygous or loss of function heterozygous, and they have very large effects. And again, from a neurobiological standpoint, that's great news. But we also have challenges. We have, we have rare mutations, which means that they may only be present in one family, two families, 1% 1 of children. And so when you want to ask questions about the relationship between those mutations and outcome, treatment response, just defining based on the mutation type is rough. You have no statistical power. So we're going to have to begin to understand how they fit together. As I've told you, we have tremendous heterogeneity. These genes, while I can give you kind of a rough assessment about what they do, a one sentence, in fact, most of them do many things and many different things, particularly across development. So it's not going to be trivial to understand what not only what a single gene is doing, but what these groups of genes are doing. And what I've put here is that not only is there tremendous cellular and anatomical diversity in, in human brain that is an incredibly complex organ, so that understanding what a mutation is doing in the cerebellum a particular cell type is not the same thing as finding out what it's doing in the cortex in a particular cell type. But we're also, um, with respect to Dr. Yanish, I, I do believe that there's very likely to be a functional, ongoing functional problem um, in cases of autism, many cases of autism. I'm hoping that that's the case because it gives us an entree into treatment. But at the same time, as a child psychiatrist, um, I have a strong sense that there's also developmental component and that it's going to be tough in some cases in autism to, um, uh, to try to reverse deficits after development has fully proceeded. Um, I'm actually, uh, I thought I had five more minutes, but um, uh, I don't. Really? High level. All right. So basically, I'm going to give you just a brief view of three ways that we are, you sure? Okay. Three ways that we're approaching this. So one is that there's a traditional way that Dr. Yanish pointed out, which is to do, to, to take an organism and then to try to move from a gene, a single gene, to understand its mechanism and to turn that into an understanding of treatment targets. And despite all the complexity I told you about, that still is a tremendously, I think, exciting and, and profitable um, thing to do. And I just use one example here. This is from Dr. Gleason, who is a protege. Uh, of Dr. Walsh's. Our labs um, uh, collaborated and, and just a couple years ago found a very rare mutation, a gene called BCKDK. This implicated branch chain amino acid synthesis in rare forms of autism um, and epilepsy. And in a very simple way, we were able to see that the children who were affected had low levels of branch chain amino acids. And, and now we're, we're engaging in a study to see whether or not increasing those, particularly very early in development, because we can predict additional children, which children in these families would be at risk. So it gives you an avenue to biology, when, and I think it, just like the MECP2 story, I think it suggests that, that even through a single gene, in the midst of all this complexity, you, you may hit on something that is highly relevant. The second is, I think I've already given you an example, just looking across the list of genes, you can begin to see that they come together, and we can ask questions about whether or not they actually bind to each other and form protein-protein interaction networks. This is from two years ago um, from Evan Eichler's group. 
And the punchline to this was that chromatin modifiers were important, and they picked that out as an early signal by looking at how these various disparate signals came together. Um, and then the final thing that I'll say is that you can do that either statically, just looking at databases of protein interactions. More recently, my lab and Nenad Sestin's lab has tried to leverage an increasing understanding of the developmental trajectory of genes in human brain in order to do that same kind of pathway analysis, but to do it with spatial and temporal variables as opposed to just doing it cross-sectionally. And, and what our lab has been able to identify is that a very small subset of the initial genes with autism actually form a very tight network in space and time in developing human brain. And that it actually puts us in one region of brain, the developing human cortex, at one particular point in time, mid-fetal development, and in one particular cell type, a cortical deep layer glutamatergic neurons. So the, these are just three examples of the fact that I think that now that we have a bounty of genes, that there are paths forward, multiple paths forward. Um, and, um, and, and I hope that I've convinced you now that that may lead to the type of understanding of biology that can do the same type of transformation for autism that we've seen for transformations in pediatric cancer, in inflammatory bowel disease, in autoimmune dysfunction, et cetera. Um, I think I probably have hit all these points, and I am running now three minutes late, so I'm going to end here. And thank you very much for your attention.